Oh, uh, that looks kind of funny up there. <laughs> the screen up there, should we? Are you sure? Or can we just alert your mic that? Or, oh, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry. sorry. <laughs> too many, too many screens. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sure. All right, cool. Okay. Hello. Uh, Please take your seats um, and um, welcoming Kieran Ryan Anderson back to uh, our last lecture for today. And he will wrap up today's uh, introduction, very, you know, intense introduction uh, to quantum error correction. So, okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Uh, all right, so I will basically start out, off uh, where Ben left off. However, uh, I'm not a masochist, or at least I don't like writing codes this way. Um, if we take the same code, the Tor code, uh, let's see. So we want to do, 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 oh, we want four of these things and whatnot. And instead of, um, doing, instead of having the checks on the vertices uh, and the qubits on the edges and the Z checks on the, the, the uh, plaquettes, uh, if we put the qubits on the vertices, that's where I like to put them because they look like little points and kind of reminds me of qubits. Then we have uh, these like X, 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 X checks, Z, 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 Z. It's the same code. It's just a different representation. Sometimes this is called the the medial uh, code, the medial mapping of the code. Um, and we can take this Tor code that Ben described. And if we want to do everything in 2D, uh, like some devices uh, kind of uh, is more natural for them, then we can take basically a slice of this torus. Uh, um, and we can just add extra checks along the boundaries. And we get a another version of the torque code, this time though the uh, planar surface code. Uh, in particular, this is often known as the rotated planar surface code because the first version of it had more checks and you can like slice it in a different way and whatnot, but it's not important. Um, so yeah, this one is a 913 code. So it has one logical qubit, unlike the torus that has two. Um, here we have, Let's see, is this working? So it does go back and forth, but the little magic dot thing doesn't seem to work. Okay, um, no problem. Sorry. Uh, so here we have a logical X operator uh, going from top to bottom. Uh, so here, um, instead of having, there is a version of the logical operator, logical X operator that, that's kind of X, poly X on each of the qubits, each of the vertices. Um, uh, but here you can make the low, lower weight ones by just having a string of poly X's that, that, that you, so you apply an X on each of the qubits from top to bottom and they're equivalent logical operators that just run from top to bottom. So as long as you can connect those top and bottom boundaries with a, an, a set of X poly operators, it's equivalent to a logical X operator. Um, and then likewise, the Z goes from like uh, horizontally, it connects the, the boundaries from, from, from left to right. As long as you have a, a set of Z poly operators that do that, then it is um, equivalent to a logical Z. Uh, now these, in these diagrams, um, I'm using similar diagrams like Ben discussed. Uh, I'm using the darker gray boxes to represent uh, the operators where we measure joint X, uh, uh, X's for those qubits that touch that polygon, those polygons. And for the lighter boxes, um, uh, it's a joint Z operator that we're measuring. So these are the set of, of, of stabilizers written in pictorial form. So it's a lot nicer um, uh, to work with than potentially this for, for larger codes. Um, and yeah, so, so we have, uh, n minus one unique, or yeah, n minus one, where n is the number of data qubits, unique 
uh, stabilizer generators. So that means, as Ben mentioned, each poly operator divides the space in half uh, uh, orthogonally. And so that means that um, the space has uh, two minus the number of things that divide it in half. So that means um, if you do n minus in parentheses, n minus one, it all cancels and you get uh, two to the n. So it it's a logical you know, two level system. So it has one logical qubit in it. So that's what the t two means there. Um, ben also described this thing. So this is the distance three color code or the, also known as the steam code for, that, for the distance three version. And this is the distance five uh, version of the color code. Notice there's lots of colors and the, and the surface code is all black and white. Um, it is related to the, 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 the surface code, um, kind of very similar. It's also a topological code. Um, here though, the polygons don't represent just one type of poly operator that, that we're going to measure, one type of observable. It represents two types. So for example, this big, let me attempt, nope, the pointer doesn't work. Um, so uh, each polygon, or once again, the vertices represent uh, the qubits, the data qubits, and the polygons represent um, both the observable where you're measuring uh, joint X's for all those qubits, as well as the other observable where you're measuring joint Z for all, all these qubits. So it's a self dual, dual code. Um, it's a CSS code. So CSS means that you can write the set of generators in, either as only a Z polytype or X polytype. So you have a combination of X and Z, purely X and Z generators. Um, and this is self dual because the X and Z uh, look exactly the same. And of course, you can multiply those together and get Y. So uh, you could use, you could also measure the observables where there are joint Y operators for those um, polygons. Um, unlike surface code, um, there's more symmetry, which is both a blessing and a curse, or well, uh, both a benefit and a con for the color code. Um, it's, it, it means that it, it has a lot more more uh, logical operators that are possible. Um, it also means that for each one of these boundaries, so you see this like X string and then this Y string and the Z string that kind of, um, if you imagine a triangle, those are often called triangular codes on like the square of the surface code. Um, it, it connects the, the, you know, the points on this triangle, um, each one of these operators do, but each boundary, these, uh, these three boundaries, can have an X, Y, or Z logical operator. So you can you can apply a set of poly operators that are either all X's, which is equivalent to an, a logical X operator, Y, which is equivalent to a logical Y operator, and Z, which is equivalent to a logical Z operator. So it doesn't really have this polarization that the surface code has. It's a slight different, um, uh, yeah, slightly different con um, characteristic. Um, so I should say, uh, yeah, we're, this is kind of going to start out as sort of a, uh, introducing you to some familiar codes that, that, uh, that you might study in quantum error correction, but then we're going to go deeper. So this is kind of using as a, um, to get you familiar and then start working on like, what do these circuits look like and, and how does all that work? Um, okay. So the you, there's actually a bunch of different surface codes and a bunch of different color codes that you can potentially construct it turns out um, if you for, for the surface codes where you only have either x type or z type observables um, uh, if, and you put the qubits on the vertices then you get uh, graphs like, like that that are able to support these type of codes that are too colorable and that uh, have a degree of four. So each vertex only has four edges at most. And then you can cut little codes out of these graphs. So long as you like make sure that you have the right number of stabilizers and whatnot. And then similar for the color code, pretty bunch of pretty colors, but really that has to do with the three color ability, which also, if you have both X and Z type uh, checks for both of these, for, for these polygons, um, and you want to make sure that everything commutes and, and whatnot, you end up getting a three colorable graph. 
Okay. Mm, that's, that's, it's just to introduce that they, you might hear about color codes and surface codes, but there's all there's a lot of other versions of those codes that that haven't been that that don't tend to be studied. Um, you can do a lot more with them. Um, there's also non-uniform tilings of the planes that you can also cut codes out of. Uh, it also doesn't really matter. Um, the geometry of these things don't matter. These are all equivalent graphs. So this four eight eight nomenclature right here just represents if you sit at a point and you kind of walk along um, and, and you look at all the polygons that touch that point, you have polygons of, of you know, with four sides, eight sides, eight sides. So all these other graphs are equivalent. Um, so you can lay these things out, you know, you could, if you have a, a computer that has long range connectivity, you could, like ions, <laughs> you could have all sorts of geometries if you want. So the, the connectivity isn't really so important. Um, these things just help us kind of visualize what the stabilizers look like in a sort of an abstract manner. Um, so um, a lot of codes, but not necessarily all, although you can form families of them, but a lot of codes have families of, uh, of codes or belong to a family where um, you can kind of parameterize it by the distance of the code, which we've talked about before. So. It's mentioned the distance minus one divided by two, so just slightly less than half is the number of, of uh, flips either from various poly uh, poly operators that it can handle before, or yeah, that, that the code's guaranteed to handle. It's possible that codes can handle more than that, but it's not guaranteed to handle all the, like the same. So the distance three code, for example, can potentially handle weight two errors, but not all weight two errors. It's just guaranteed that at that, that T value, it can definitely correct that. Beyond that, there's some probability whether it can correct those or not. Anyway, but, but so as, um, as you make these codes larger and larger, as you can see, they can correct more and more errors. So that means they can suppress the uh, uh, logical error rate, you know, because we're spreading the information across many qubits and um, and let's see, let me verify what time. Okay, um, we're spreading information across uh, uh, many qubits, and so uh, this means that since it can handle more and more errors, that means that uh, given that you know errors pop in with a certain probability, that means that we can squash them fast. Ho ho you know, it's easier for us to squash them. Uh, it, we can wait longer or we have more of a chance to, to squash them you know, before they build up. Um, here's an example of a family, two different families of the color code. So the steam, this is the distance three one is the steam code, uh, which Ben talked about. Then you can also construct larger uh, versions of the color code by cutting out you know, the codes out of these graphs. Uh, that I mentioned. Um, common ones are either this, this 488 lattice, which is on the top, or the 666 lattice on the bottom, which is uh, an ominous number. Okay, um, you might have heard of this word threshold, and maybe you've heard of uh, the concept of a pseudo threshold. So the um, pseudo threshold refers to the performance of a code like for a single code instance, not the entire family. So um, what we have here in this graph it, it, on the X axis is the physical error rate. And then on the Y axis is the logical error rate. And then this dotted line is when at the, those two error rates equal each other. And so there's some point in which the code gets overwhelmed and the probability of a higher weights errors happening is too high and you know you end up applying the wrong operation you end up flip you know applying logical operations whenever you try to do your corrections instead of fixing the, the faults before they become an error if it's low enough then you can start suppressing the the uh, error rate so you get like a p squared effect or if it higher distance codes like distance five you get you can you can go from p to p cubed and so on so you can keep on quadratically suppressing the noise. And so 
the place where this curve kind of hits this x, uh, you know, the x equals y line when logical, the logical and physical error rates are equal are known as the pseudo threshold. Pseudo threshold because it's not, not a full threshold. The threshold refers to the family of codes. I sort of kind of mentioned this before with the repetition code that at, for the repetition code, as the number of qubits or not, well, the number of bits goes towards infinity, then you know that as long as less than half of those bits flip, the majority vote will, will, will um, send you to the right outcome. Um, it is the same sort of idea with quantum error correction codes. What happens is as the distance increases, as I mentioned before, you get uh, steeper and steeper uh, slope. So you suppress the noise more. So you get higher power, you know, you go from, as I mentioned, P squared, P cubed, P to the fourth and so on. Um, and eventually as the distance goes towards infinity, effectively you get a step function. Um, and so that dotted line where that step function is tells you that so long as the physical error rate is lower than that, there's some arbitrarily large code in which you can arbitrarily suppress the noise. Of course, you won't live in asymptotia, but you can choose a, a large enough code to, to do whatever you need given your physical error rates. So you obviously, if you can reduce your physical error rates, that's great and you want to do that because you kind of get more out of the code. Um, it's, you know, you, you drop faster. Um, it's also good to be aware of if you're trying to run simulations where you're trying to like work out these thresholds like you sometimes see in papers, um, you need to look at, uh, so the first sort of distances like distance three, five, seven, <clears throat> um, their curves kind of wiggle about. So eventually these curves kind of settle down into a sort of a trend and you can kind of you know fit that those those curves to a function a higher order function and work out what the what sort of the inflection point is which corresponds to this threshold but the first sort of small codes have this small size effect so um the the curves are kind of like settling down at first so you can't really use like distance three distance five distance seven in order to work out what your thresholds are um you have to kind of start out maybe at nine or 11 and then work up. Uh, so just in case you do those sorts of simulations in the future, maybe for the hackathon, maybe not. Um, yeah, and this is um, how the, the logical error rate roughly scales. Um, you can kind of see that uh, if you ignore, ignore the PTH, which represents the, the, prob the threshold error rate, P represents the physical error rate, then um, D plus one over two is really the same thing as T plus one. So, I, so uh, like I mentioned, a distance three code would suppress the noise by T plus one, so two P squared uh, and, and so on. Uh, <laughs> this is a shameless plug. Uh, uh, I do have a package that does quantum error correction. Uh, you can take a look at it uh, there. You can potentially use that uh, to, to do simulations. Um, anyway, so I think Ben um, briefly touched on uh, measurements, but I'm, I'll, I'll talk about those sort of again to, in a different way. Um, I'm mainly focusing on how do these circuits work whenever we want to measure these observables for generic, uh, you know, poly operators that we want to measure. So um, this can like dot with a line and P is to represent a controlled poly. So that's equivalent to, uh, you know, if, if the qubit is in the zero state, apply identity, if the qubit's in the one state for the control, apply the poly. And that, you know, you could put an X in there and that's the equation for the C naught or the control X gate, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we're going to work out, oh yeah, sorry. So we have this circuit here and what that turns out to be is one way of, of measuring polys. So we introduce an insula, we apply a Hadamard, we do this control poly, another Hadamard, and then we measure in the Z basis. 
So why does that work? I think Ben uh, maybe showed one way um, to prove this, and I guess I'll, I'll prove it again another way. It might not hurt uh, to see how this works. I think it's fairly uh, straightforward proof. So um, if we start out on the left-hand side, you know, uh, this, uh, we're in a zero tensor psi state, so the zero is the control bit or going to be our control bit. Then we apply this Hadamard, so we get a plus state. So this is this, um, you know, uh, da, da, da. this thing that's just, we've seen it a bunch of times. This is the plus state, this is superposition of zero and one. Um, and then if we apply this control, uh, uh, control poly gate, we see that, you know, we leave, leave psi alone if it's, so I'm just, I'm doing a couple of steps. First, I'm, I'm uh, converting plus into, you know, a superposition of zero and one. And so if it's zero, we don't apply the poly, we just do identity. So we just have psi. So that's that first part. And then if it's one here, then we apply the poly according to that, you know, equation above. Okay. Hopefully that's straightforward. And then we apply the Hadamard again. We that means we flip um, the control bit. And that minus state is just, you know, if we put a minus here instead of a plus. Um, and then if we, you know, move that square root from the plus and minus states over to the side to, to multiply it with that uh, one over the square root of, of two. Um, then we get that one half. And then here I'm just, you know, um, just rewriting plus and minus as, you know, zero plus one. And then over on the right hand side, zero minus one. So I'm just re substituting things in. So we get that. And now we're going to rearrange the equation where we pull out the part where, where it's all zeros. Um, so we see a zero, you know, for each one of these two terms, we see a zero in front. So I'm just gonna group those over to the side. And I'm gonna group the one over to the other side because we're getting ready to measure in the Z basis. So it's convenient to, to do that. Um, and then I can pull the operators away from the psi. So, you know, um, the first term is psi plus p times uh, psi. So I can just write that as i plus identity all times psi. And then on the other side, i minus uh, p times psi. Probably that's straightforward. Just, just a bunch of you know, algebra steps and, and substitution. And we're just getting ready to see what happens if we, we measure in zero and one. So if we measure in zero one, um, uh, if we get a plus plus outcome, it's in you know that we know that we we collapse to the the state where where the qubits the control bit is zero, and if we can get a minus, we collapse where the control bit is a one. So that's just you know taking the same equation above and just based on those two, two conditions, we get that those outcome. And I'm ignoring maybe some normalization going on. And we've seen these uh, one half plus or minus p before from Ben. But um, if you want to do the math, so let's see, I identity is just equivalent to taking the, the you know, either the Z or the X or the Y basis and taking the, um, you know, the, the part of the state that, that projects, in, you know, the, that's uh, the positive eigenvalue state, the projector for that, plus the minus eigenvalue projector. And summing those together, so the, together that projects to the entire state or the entire space. So that makes sense that it's identity. So we can just write it as the plus p projector and the minus p projector for where we can substitute p for x or z or y. And then x, y, and z can all be written like this in terms of their projectors. We this might make sense if we look at the z, for example, if if a qubit is zero, then we leave it alone. If it's one, we add a phase to it. That's where the minus sign is in the middle. It turns out in their own basis states, X, X and Y also do the same thing. Because if you think about it, 
what we label X, Y, and Z, it's, it's just convention. They should all look symmetric in their own basis states. So they should all do the same thing. So in general, we can write down that P is equal to plus the plus P projector minus the minus P projector. That'll do the same thing as some weird thing that flickered on the screen. But that'll do the same thing as, um, yeah, applying, you know, minus to the 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 part of the space that's in the the minus subspace and applying plus to the to the other side so hopefully that all makes sense and then we can do a bunch of math and substitute those values in and it turns out that this is indeed you know one one half plus p is indeed the projector for the the positive space of the poly um poly operator and uh, one half I minus P is the minus side of things. Cool, bunch of annoying algebra and whatnot. But in the end of the day, who, who cares about that math? It, it, what it tells you is that this circuit, you know, just through, through a few simple steps, we can show that what this circuit really does is it projects us into the plus uh, subspace of the poly operator or the minus one based on whether we get you know plus one or minus one that's really the important part it's easy enough to go through all that map and it's kind of boring but whatever so we just prove that it really is projecting us uh, you know you know if we get a plus one we really do get we're, we really do get projected into the plus one part of the poly space and, and so on so that's cool and this argument in general works like it's not special that it's a a uh, single poly operator, so for a single qubit, it, it'll work for the same thing uh, for multiple qubits. You can kind of can you sort of easily see it, um, but uh, or you can take my word for it. <laughs> so that means if we're trying to measure a, a joint poly operator, then in general we can use this circuit here. So that's really what we, I wanted to get to. So you can forget all that math if you want and just believe me that we can use the, you know, we can introduce an Ancilla, do a Hadamard, do these control polys, another Hadamard and measure it, measure in the Z basis. And we are effectively projecting uh, into these plus or minus of these poly operators. Or another way of thinking about it is we're measuring the eigenvalue of those, those poly operators. So this is how we measure our parity measurements. So they're all doing, they're all the same concept effectively. Um, and we can see if we're trying for like, for example, the surface code or the torque code or whatever, and we're trying to measure you know, like X, 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 then this just becomes a bunch of control knots because we, we replace those polys with X's. You can put the box there, you can put the circle there, it doesn't matter. So you get this thing. So this is the circuit for like the surface code whenever you're doing the X checks. Um, we can also see if we, don't really want to think about all that math, and we just write down the circuit and believe that um, that if we you know input an X fault into this circuit, then it'll just commute with everything and just fly through. And so it's doing what we've seen before. If if an air if a fault commutes with the operator, the operator doesn't detect it. It only detects um, when our things anti-commute with it. So if we apply a Z operator using sort of the rules that we've seen before, because Z, yeah, Z will, will hit those targets and propagate down, and then it'll get flipped to an X operator. The Z measurements will pick up on X's. It'll look like a change in the measurement outcome. So we get a minus one. And then we can also see if there's a, uh, an odd number of Z's that come in, then we get an odd number of you know z or x's that hit the uh, measurement, and so it, it will only light up. It'll only give us a minus sign if there's an odd number, and then if there's an even number, the minuses will cancel out. So once again, it's it's measuring the parity. You have an odd number of errors, you get minus one. Even number of errors, you get plus one. So it's doing the thing that we've we've you know already thought about before. Cool. Um, this is all leading to something like to think about how circuit level errors uh, of faults uh, work. So we can repeat all this stuff for Z. <laughs> it's the same sort of story. I mean, it's just the symmetric 
Um, however, people tend to write these in terms of uh, C naught. So you'll more commonly see it with C naughts going down. So we could you know, do these control Zs. That's a perfectly fine circuit you know, using, using this sort of rule that we can just put, put in whatever poly. Um, but people tend to put in these identities, these Hadamards, you know, Hadamard types of Hadamard between each one of these gates in order to convert it into um, a bunch of C naughts that point down. So if the C naughts point down towards the ancilla, it's a, it's a, um, a Z check. If the C naughts point up, um, it's an X check. And then same sort of thing. We've already seen this effectively. So yeah, these are these are the typical circuits um, that that we use. Uh, this is there are other ways to measure syndromes, and this is sometimes referred to as bare ancilla syndrome uh, method because we're using a single bare, uh, just a single syndrome, or sorry, a single ancilla. Um, there are, as I mentioned, there's other ways like Shore style syndrome extraction, Steen style syndrome extraction, Neal style syndrome extraction. They require uh, more ancilla so they can be more overhead. They have different advantages. They can, uh, a lot of them require you to measure operators more than, uh, than you would with the bare style. Some, although some of them have single shot. Uh, th so there's much more to read, but typically people study the, the um, bare style syndrome extraction. So we'll, we'll forget those other styles, but just to make you aware, there, there are other ways to do this too. So it's not unique. So go back to this. Um, oh yeah, what about, so, so far we've only considered input faults into these circuits. What happens if that doesn't occur? What if we put an X here? We see that the X in this X check, this X parity measurement that we're trying to measure, um, the X fault will propagate up and then it'll go over to the Hadamard uh, on the measurement uh, branch. It'll flip to a Z, Z commutes with Z. So it doesn't actually like, doesn't flip the measurement result. And so it's still plus one. So you don't get any alert that a, a, um, a fault has happened, but not only has we do we not get an alert about it, but we get a wait one thing happening, a wait one error or fault happening, becoming a wait two fault. That doesn't sound good because that potentially can lower the distance of our code. It's effectively as though we have, you know, with probability P, we have a higher weight things occurring. So that means that we need a larger code to deal with that potentially. Um, and then of course the symmetric thing happens uh, for the, the Z check. Okay, that should potentially make you nervous. However, uh, for various codes, there's ways to uh, mitigate this. So for a while, it was believed that, that you just have to deal with this and make uh, larger distance codes. Uh, however, it turned out, I think Fowler um, discovered this, um, that it turns out that you can choose the schedule in which you do these C knots um, so that the, like you do get these higher weight uh, um, uh, faults occurring, um, like so, like we've already seen. H however, uh, you could, by choosing the schedule, you can make sure that like the, the C knots, you can measure all these C, you can measure all these operators in parallel. And you can also make sure that you choose the direction in which the, the faults occur. So if we zoom up, um, so that the over on the left hand side, um, we kind of see a little bit of the X operator running up and then that purplish uh, thing um, uh, that's supposed to represent an error is perpendicular to it. So that's, that's an X error that's growing perpendicular to the logical, the logical X operator. And then the green um, uh, fault here is, per, is, is a Z type fault, but it's also perpendicular to the uh, logical Z operator. So essentially we're not growing the errors in the direction in which they're applying, they, they would lead to a logical uh, error. It kind of looks like if you, you know, look in the right direction, that's a wait one thing effectively in that dimension. 
Um, also, uh, I should mention that you can also think of the uh, surface code also like a repetition code where you're taking the uh, bit flip and phase flip code and you kind of see it along the edges and then you're kind of doing like a Cartesian product of the, of the two. Uh, so there's like by learning the repetition code, you, you kind of see it all over the place as well in, in other codes. Okay, what about this uh, color, the color codes or the steam codes? Also for a while, even longer because they're less studied than, than the uh, surface codes, um, people thought we had to deal with these bad uh, errors. These bad errors are sometimes known as hook errors because they kind of you know go up and over, kind of like a hook. Um, so we do know, of course, using the same sort of circuitry, if you have an X input error, then it, it propagates down to, to, or yeah, this is a Z check where you see the C knots going down. Uh, the X error on this Z check will propagate down and the Z check will, will detect this X error. And so in this code, for example, um, we, the X error is being applied to qubit seven over in the corner and it anti-commutes with this uh, red Z check um, it flips it to a minus one. And so that kind of like locates effectively, assuming that it's a low weight error uh, where the uh, X error occurred. However, what happens if we measure this X check and an error occurred like we saw before in the middle of the check? Okay, it propagates down and once again, it's silent, um, this check is. But then we'll end up you know, at some point measuring Z checks. So, uh, over here is the results of if we then measured Z check. So we get plus one, plus one for the green and, and blue over on the left hand side, uh, because each one touches the, the X uh, faults an even number of times. So it doesn't flip it. We're, we're detecting parodies, but it, it touches that red Z check over on the right uh, an odd number of times once. So it flips that. That looks exactly like what we just saw. So you're more likely to choose a correction where you flip, you apply an X to qubit seven. And if you do do that, you'll get a string of X's. It turns out that string of X's is also a logical operator. So now we have a weight one error. If you include the correction leading to a logical failure or a logical error, it's in the proper error, not a failure. Um, that's horrible. So you might think, okay, I just have to increase the size of the code and, and deal with it. Turns out, however, that we can supplement our circuit. We can introduce a, a, a flagging qubit, an additional qubit, and, and we can see that effectively, if nothing happens, it acts like identity. So those controls kind of can, can, you can, uh, if you have controls touching in these CNOTs, they, they can go past each other, they commute. Um, so we can bring these C knots over to each other and they cancel their identity. So if nothing happens, this is just a fancy identity. However, if this internal fault happens, the, the X error does propagate down and we get um, you know, a, a non-trivial result. We get a, a, the, the, this outcome flipping. So these flag these internal hook errors. So this allows us to, to um, you know, modify our circuit and um, get back the distance of the code. So that's cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's mainly the stuff that I was going to cover. I actually don't know. I assume it'll be what six o'clock that we stop at. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. <laughs> uh, so that that's mainly what uh, th th this kind of shows how you have to deal with fault tolerance. So. Um, there's a lot of people that will use the phrase uh, something is, is fault tolerant if, if, the, um, if you're kind of in the regime in which the code is suppressing noise. I don't think that's a good use of the term. It kind of conflates kind of it being beneficial quantum error correction. Uh, I usually like to reserve the, the word fault tolerant, meaning you can handle any T errors or T faults and recover it yourself. So it's T fault tolerant or K fault tolerant, sometimes it's called. And that's a better, uh, annoyingly, you'll see this even by people that know stuff that they'll, they'll use the same word fault tolerance to mean two or maybe three different things. And that's kind of an annoying thing in the field. So sometimes you have to be clear about what they actually mean. Um, anyway, so that's a little rant. But um, 
But this effectively is showing how, how you have to do things in order to ensure fault tolerance, that you can, you can uh, ensure that your code is able to correct all faults to up to the, what the code was designed to be. All right. Um, if you are doing the challenges for the quantum error correction stuff, uh, depending on the challenge, uh, you might want to think about uh, doing simulations, or you might, you know, just after this, just get interested and, or just read the QEC paper and want to know um, how, what, what, whether, what the, this QEC paper is actually saying. You have to be careful about whenever you're reading QEC papers, um, the error rates that they report, because uh, the error rates really depend on a lot of things, like the, the circuitry that you're using, as we've seen, like different circuitry can lead to different performance, but also sort of the classical algorithm that you're using to come off the corrections, as well as the level, the, the, the type of error model, the type of noise that's being applied to the circuitry will, will change how the code performs. And all those things are super important. So there's not one size fit all number for like the threshold of our code. Um, it's really dependent on stuff. But often, uh, because it's a lot easier to simulate, people will also use a simpler um, noise model. Um, and, and you shouldn't be confused by it, because like, yeah, let's, let's just go through. So this is a list of different common noise models uh, from easier to uh, harder. And they typically, uh, yeah, they, the thresholds will be higher and then quickly drop as the, the, you look at more and more details. So the simplest noise model that not, not as much people look at, but it's definitely more popular in like classical error correction, but some people do look at it in quantum error correction because it is a useful noise model, um, is the erasure channel, the, the erase, erasure no, noise model. Essentially what you do is you just, um, you know, take a qubit, and you just completely depolarize it, or you think about like removing it, all the like like projecting it out, and then replacing it later on. But you get to know that sounds horrible, but you get to know in this this model which qubits have done that. So that extra information um, allows you to actually uh, do do a lot a lot with uh, uh, like um, with that, you can come up with classical algorithms or to fix your code and come up with corrections a lot easier than some other noise models, just by the fact that you know where the, no where the qubit got deleted uh, is. Um, the, like, if this happened in an actual physical device, you have a way to herald whenever errors happen that, that helps you out a lot because, you know, as mentioned many times, the quantum information in these uh, codes is spread across the the code, and there's many different logical operators. And so you can you can actually start deleting parts of the code, and as long as you are able to reset them and remeasure these checks, which project you back into a code space, then you can recover from it. So long as you don't delete too much of your code, is because no one qubit holds the information. It's the information is spread across the system. All right, the next and pretty common noise model that people study is known as the code capacity uh, model. And that um, is basically uh, tells you the capacity of the code in, in, in a very abstract sense. So you don't have any of the details, uh, we don't have any circuits here, but we don't, you don't have any of the details of the circuitry um, you kind of pretend as though you have magic, a magic way of just measuring these parity checks without any error. So you could get, just get to do that. And you just study what are the, like if you have input errors. So the stuff that we were originally talking about, just like, okay, if we have, have these input errors and we could just measure these checks and we just detect whether things commute or anti-commute, um, that's what this level of, of noise model is. So you just choose which qubits with probability P have X, Y, or Z noise, and then you measure the pair, the, the checks. Um, and then you get, you know, perfect measurements from that. The next level uh, of difficulty is, it's a bit of a mouthful, the phenomenological model. Um, and that's, you know, based on like, what is the overall phenomenon looking like? Um, 
So we, we do still have these input errors and we do have magic, um, you know, magic ways of just measuring the, these checks where we just detect the parity. But now we add in the fact that, that uh, we model that, that there's some probability in which the measurements can flip. So we have a bit flip channel on the measurements for these parities. Um, that, th that alone makes the decoding process, this classical algorithm that comes with corrections much harder. And for a lot of codes, uh, except for codes that have what's called shingles, single shot uh, syndrome extraction, um, you typically have to measure this, um, these checks, uh, of these uh, stabilizer generators uh, multiple times. Effectively, you're kind of measuring a, a repetition code in time. You're just repeating it, and you're you could do the majority vote on those things, um, but the, there are more complex algorithms in order to do with the correlations and, and all sorts of stuff. So you have to, you effectively do a, a repetition code in time. So the repetition code, once again, is popping up um, just by the fact that, that you have these measurement uh, flips happening it's because you can't rely on the actual measurements. So you have to uh, correct, you know, have to deal with correcting the measurement outcomes as well. And then we get, of course, to the circuit level, which uh, modeling, where we start applying noise at the circuit level. So you actually care, start to care about what your device actually is doing. And there's various levels in which people will actually uh, run these models. So even given the circuit model, traditionally in the past, people have just looked at the depolarizing channel. Um, however, we and, and others are starting to model more exotic noise like leakage and crosstalk and coherent noise and so on to model what devices actually look like. And that can, of course, change the performance of codes. Um, but in a more simple, uh, well, yeah, even for that system, um, generally what you do is you, you, like for each one of your ideal gates, you have some error channel that you then apply afterwards. So initialization, you might do a bit flip or something. Um, or a single qubit unitaries, you might apply some random poly or something else. Two qubit unitaries, same sort of story. Measurement, you, you might apply the uh, some poly a bit before it if you like resetting the qubit or kind of equivalently, you could do a bit flip on the, on the measurement results and so on. So this is far more accurate. And you can like in, if I remember right, the color code has uh, a code capacity threshold of 20%. Uh, and then the surface code has a code capacity threshold of around uh, 10%. So the color code's better there. But then due to the complexity of the, of the circuitry, once you start looking at all that, the surface code tends to have, uh, depends on who you, you read and the level of modeling that they're doing, but around 0.8% uh, threshold once you look at the circuit. So it's gone from 10% to 0.8. And then the color code is around uh, point, I think, three eight or something, roughly 0.4 percent. So half half the um, threshold at the circuit level compared to the surface code. So it's it's dropped significantly, and what was better, uh, you know, seemingly a better performing code is now less performing. Uh, although there's constantly advances in like the decoding, the classical decoding algorithms, which can potentially improve the results. So it's like not. Like things can change in the future, which codes perform well, and and so on. Oh, looks like we have seven minutes. Uh, okay, um, probably won't say. Yeah. So I mentioned before that that if you do start adding in noisy measurements, which all, you know everything starting from the phenomenological model on have, then you have to deal with um, uh, decoding in space time. So a common decoder that people study is min weight perfect matching decoder. Um, you could try to encode all this stuff in a lookup table, like we mentioned before, where you just kind of like write down the set of syndromes you might see, and then what corrections might you apply. However, you know, uh, because you know, obviously, if you have here, here I'm using n to be the number of syndromes that you're measuring. But <clears throat> if you're measuring the syndromes multiple times. And there's a, I guess really it's it's, you'd have to multiply this the number of time steps times the number of actual syndromes, uh, and the number of syndromes actually grow based on the distance, usually d squared or depends on the code. Like this this blows up really fast, and you can't really compute these things. So you have to use a, a, an algorithm, not just store the stuff 
in, in memory, but actual an algorithm in order to look at these like changes in measurement results. So these nodes here represent flips in the, the syndromes and you try have to find was the string of poly operators that, that, that most likely um, cause these flips. That's what that sort of represents. I won't go into all that. Okay, let's see. Uh, six minutes, I guess I could either leave for questions or just keep on going. I'll keep on going. <laughs> uh, this, I think, will maybe kind of be brief. Uh, I'm not going to cover things still not in depth. But so as I mentioned before, codes don't have a universal gate set in general. There might be some fancy ways, but but at least uh, of, of, of getting around this and maybe some future codes that are more exotic that kind of change in time and, and morph and do weird things might. Um, but that's, you know, ignoring those sorts of codes. Um, Easton Canilla says, as it says on the thing, um, that no, no code has a transversal set of gates that are fault tolerant and universal. So that means we'll, we'll talk about what transversal means. It's essentially that you're applying uh, a single layer of gates. So you're just, you, you, don't, you don't have a deep um, set of gates that you're applying in order to apply these logical operations. You're just doing like uh, one, one operation per data qubit uh, up to that, maybe less even. Um, so no simple, you don't have these simple transversal gates that give you a universal set. So that means effectively that you have a discrete set of gates that you have to do for a particular code. But that that would be a, a bummer and kind of mean that the, the QEC game is all over and done with if there weren't workarounds. So of course, there, there are ways to go, go around like this Easton Canal and other no-go theorems. Uh, a common thing that people look at is what's called magic state distillation. Um, so there is a actual proper phrase called magic in quantum error correction. Um, yeah, uh, and there you could also potentially, because no one code has a universal set, you can potentially use more than one code to kind of fill each other, uh, you know, to fill up the, the, the set of gates that you need in order to construct a universal gate set. Um, so you can potentially do code switching where you use one, one code to do certain gates and then you switch the information over to another code. That's potentially complicated. And there have been papers that kind of show that magic state distillation might still have uh, lower overheads, even if you do those sorts of things. But I mean, there's still, it's still an active area of research. There's other things like feasible fault tolerance that also get around it and so on. Um, let's see how much time, three minutes. Okay, transversal gates. <laughs> We've already seen some transversal gates, like these poly operators. You're just applying a string of poly operators as a depth one circuit. Um, yeah, so we can we've seen that that both the color code and the surface code have these poly operators, these logical poly operators as transversal gates. Um, the surface code doesn't have a Hadamard, which I think Ben briefly mentioned, that's transversal unless you do permutations, which I think he also mentioned. Um, it does have a CNOT gate that you can do transversely because it's a CSS code. So all CSS codes can have these transversal CNOT gates. The color code's nice in that it has all these symmetries. So you actually get all single qubit and two qubit gates as transversal operations. Um, transversal operations. Let's sk skip this poly stuff. Okay, so the Hadamard example. If we apply Hadamard to all the data qubits then these X checks become Z checks and the Z checks become X checks. It switches the poly type. Um, and then our, what was our X operator becomes our Z operator because it becomes all Zs and, and vice versa. So it is on the logical level, switching between X and Z like the Hadamard should do. So it is a logical Hadamard. However, you notice that the code has now effectively rotated and we, and we typically want the code to be back in its, its original state. So, if you're in a fixed 2D geometry device, then you might have to do a set of operations to do those rotations. Or if you're in Eintraps and you kind of get it for free because you don't really care like the labeling, you just move things to gate zones. Um, so we can see if we do somehow, however we do it, rotate the code around, we get the same thing as the original, except the X is over on the other side. However, as I've mentioned before, any string that that's uh, connects the top and bottom boundary is equivalent. You can multiply by stabilizers to get 
to, to move the thing over and it still has the same logical information. So we've gotten back the code and we have indeed done the transversal Hadamard. Uh, the color code can do it and it doesn't need to move things around because uh, X's and Z's are symmetric. So everything's symmetric and you're good. And all the boundaries can have the same sort of poly X, Y, and Z type stuff. So you're all good. Much uh, One minute, okay. <laughs> In one minute, I can explain that, that uh, well, maybe not one minute, but close to one minute, I can explain the transversal C-naught. Uh, so how do you entangle two code blocks? So there are other ways to do these entanglements as I mentioned as before, uh, but we'll just focus on the transversal gate because it's a lot simpler. So the transversal gate for all these C CSS codes, all you have to do is, as Ben mentioned, you put these uh, the corresponding C-naught in one block, that's your control block, that's representing one of your logical qubits to the corresponding qubit in the other block that's your target block. So it's sort of like this. So we have you know, two codes and we're just stringing uh, C nuts between them. And um, by these rules, we can see that we can, like, we'll take that X logical string and the X, uh, the, having these C nuts, I'm just concentrating on the C nuts in the boundary. There's C nuts everywhere that's you know, touching the corresponding qubits. I'm just highlighting the C nuts on the boundary. But using the rules of the C nuts, you, you get the X to come down. And so we get, you know, the X, logical X on the top to be a logical X on the top and bottom. And so on, like the, the logical X on the bottom remains the same, doesn't change, is there. So we get the same sort of rules on the physical, that we see on the physical level, on the logical level by doing these sets of operations, cool. And the same sort of story on the logical level, but in the reverse, for the, or sorry, for the Z um, side of things, but in the reverse. And now, okay, I'm over time, but I'm almost done. Uh, if we have two like X and Z checks on the top and bottom, so S1 and S2, if we apply this, the, the C naught between all the qubits, then we do get a doubling of like S1 because the X flow down. But as Ben has mentioned, we, we, we can rewrite our generators where we can just multiply stabilizers by each other. And so if we just multiply S1 by S2 and S2 hasn't changed because it doesn't flow up from the target, um, then we get back to the original uh, uh, S1 prime in this case and S2. So we get effectively the same original stabilizers and the same source story um, for the uh, Z, Z thing, but everything flows in the opposite direction. So I'll share these, these slides and you can see that the, at least here's a quick proof of why, why CSS codes do have transversal operations that entangle code blocks. Sorry for going a couple of minutes over. Well, thank you very much for this nice uh, final talk today. Uh, we don't have anything planned after this, so you are released for the evening. Um, there is going to be, I think, dinner served down at the Adriatico at like seven-ish, but you should check in case you don't want to uh, go somewhere else like Trieste and catch a bus. But in any case, um, that was a very uh, nice day again, day two, I think. You learned a lot. and. Keep in mind, you're learning here from experts, right? So it's very special that uh, we can get you pulled into here from all the important work you're doing. So both for you and Ben, thank you very much uh, for this afternoon session. Yeah. Good time. Good time.